Hello, good morning. Today on our show is the brilliant Dr. Edward Dutton, and we will be discussing intelligence. How are you doing, Edward? I'm all right, yes. Hello, Lipson. How's it, go how's it going? Yes, I'm great. I'm really, really great, and I'm expecting us to have a wonderful show. Now, I contend that intelligence is a function of skepticism, and ATs are intelligent because they are skeptical. Am I correct, Ed? This is in light of your paper, why is intelligence negatively associated with religion? That atheists are intelligent because they're skeptical. Um, well, I think you have compete, you ha intelligence is, is correlates with many different traits and some of those can compete with each other. So, and cancel each other out. So it is true that people who are intelligent do tend to be capable of thinking in a more analytical way. And in that sense, uh, people who are intelligent are more skeptical. Um, but on the other hand, people who are intelligent are uh, more uh, able to uh, absorb information. And so in that sense, they are more brainwashable. And so in that sense, they are less skeptical. People who are intelligent are higher in generalized trust. And so in that sense, they are less skeptical. And most importantly, there is quite sound evidence that people who are intelligent are more likely to take whatever the dominant perspective is, uh, the dominant worldview. They'll, they'll understand better what that is. They'll understand better the benefits of uh, being on the winning team and holding to that worldview. So they'll absorb that worldview better and they will convince themselves through a kind of effortful control, intelligent people being higher in self-control and things like this, they will convince themselves that they believe it. Um, and so it tends to be the case that if the dominant worldview is conservatism, then intelligent people will be more conservative, will compete to be conservative. And if the dominant worldview is liberalism, they will be more liberal and compete to be liberal. So on the one hand, yes, intelligence is associated with skepticism, but on the other hand, uh, no, it isn't. And I don't think that it is skepticism that is the main reason why intelligent people tend to be atheists. Brilliant analysis. No, Ed, would you tell us a little about your paper? Why is intelligence negatively associated with religion? Yes, well, we uh, this was a paper I wrote about four years ago, and uh, myself and my colleague Dimitri van der Linden, we wanted to test the different theories. With, there are diff different uh, theories with regard to why intelligence is negatively associated with religiousness. Um, one theory is simply that, uh, which was put forth by uh, Helmut Nyborg, is simply that uh, uh, if, you, if you, you people want to make sense of the world, they have a desire for a, a, a structured world. Uh, and, and if they are intelligent enough, then they will use science to structure the world. But if they're not intelligent enough to deal with science or cope with science, then they will use religion. Uh, another theory is simply that the arguments for the existence of God don't, don't really work. They're not really convincing. And so the logical and intelligent thing to do is to not believe in God. Uh, um, yet another theory is what was put forth by Satoshi Karazawa, which is the, the uh, um, uh, Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis in which he argues that we are evolved essentially to live on the savannah and so we have instincts that relate to living on the savannah and anything that deviates if we're put in a situation an evolutionary mismatch where we're no longer on the savannah um, then uh, we will deviate from that uh, people who are intel intelligence is not evolutionary evolutionarily familiar it's evolutionarily novel so it's not how we solve problems on the savannah to a great extent. And so that means that if you are intelligent, you will be attracted to evolutionarily nov novel things that weren't big on the savannah. And this includes atheism. And I've proposed a number of problems with that, um, such as that uh, there is evidence that people on the savannah didn't, didn't actually believe in gods, firstly. Um, uh, and they just worshipped ancestors and so on. Uh, and secondly, uh, th th it's unclear where you draw the line between evolutionarily novel and evolutionarily familiar. And thirdly, that we carried on, um, indeed, evolutionary pressure sped up once we left the uh, savannah and were in the, in the Holocene period. But the suggestion of myself and my colleague is that an element of intelligence involves the ability to suppress instinct. So what intelligence is, is the ability to solve cognitive problems and you will be better able to solve cognitive problems if you are 
in a sense, low in instinct, if you are able to put aside what would be the instinctive answer and carefully reason out the answer. And it would potentially follow that people that were higher in intelligence would basically be low in instinct. That as you become higher in intelligence, you will be, in a sense, less instinctive. And uh, it would follow from that uh, that if people are low in instinct who are more intelligent, then one of the instincts that we seem to be evolved towards, and there's a lot of evidence for this, one thing is that because it, it come, it's a human universal and it comes in at times of stress, so it tends to be an instinct, is religious belief. So you would expect um, a religious people to, be, uh, to have lower, less powerful instincts. This would include an instinct towards or cognitive bias towards religious belief. Um, and so it struck me that that might be the most parsimonious theory explaining the negative uh, to the extent that it's to the extent that it is always the case, um, uh, explaining the relationship between religiousness and um, intelligence. All right. So, Ed, during our discussion, you noted that intelligent people tend to support the dominant worldview. But Isaac Newton was different. What is the difference between someone who is brilliant like Isaac Newton and the average person who is fairly intelligent? What's, what, 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 what really sets them apart? Well, um, the first thing is that Isaac Newton had wasn't just in he wasn't in the normal intelligence range. He had outlier high intelligence, extremely high intelligence. And as um, uh, uh, people become more intelligent, then the kind what's called general intelligence. Then we, we have different kinds of intelligence. You have, uh, let's say, uh, to simplify it, linguistic intelligence, mathematical intelligence, and spatial intelligence. And these all intercorrelate such that underneath them you have something that we can call general intelligence. And beneath those three kinds of intelligence, you have even narrower kinds of intelligence, like the ability to I know, count backwards or the ability to tie your shoelaces or something like that. And as we become um, more and more intelligent, it seems that the positive manifold between the different um, elements of intelligence becomes weaker and weaker and weaker, such that people that are extremely mathematically intelligent, like Sir Isaac Newton, uh, can be very unintelligent when it comes to certain other certain things that a person in the normal intelligence range would have no problem with. So Sir Isaac Newton was had no social skills. He would just get lost in thought on the stairs, even when he had guests at a party in the next room. He would forget to eat. You know, these, these basic things that, that even, a, even a child of reasonable intelligence could do, he was incapable of, um, because that was the, the, the negative side, the diminishing return of him having extremely high intelligence indeed. A second dimension to it is that one of the aspects of it, one of the, if, it's, if intelligence is defined as the ability to solve cognitive problems and how quickly you can solve them, well, you can solve them more quickly if you can take in more information. The more information you can take in, the more you can solve the problem. And there is evidence that at very high levels of intelligence, therefore, people who are very, very highly intelligent to basically have elements of autism. And that was, I think, certainly true of Sir Isaac Newton. So he would, they would, he would be extremely sensitive to stimuli because he would take in so much information. Um, and um, autism is about being systematic and whatever. And, and the opposite of that is empathy. And he was very, very low in empathy. So that's what you get among these people that are outlier high intelligence. They're not very nice people. They're not very easy people to live with. Uh, and they're not very practical people, but they, but they are able to um, uh, achieve some, some quite brilliant things. Another aspect of autism that you see with Sir Isaac Newton is obsessions. This is another aspect of autism. If you become obsessed with something, obsessed with making sense of something, then you're more likely to solve the problem and make sense of it. And he was utterly obsessed with the Bible and with finding codes in the Bible, and obsessed with alchemy as well. So they have unusual interests like autistic people because they have this very high intelligence. Well, Edward, I don't claim to be as brilliant as Isaac, but I'm also a bit unusual. So, for example, in 2014, I developed an obsession with life and philosophy. And because of that obsession, for five years straight, I went to random funerals to learn about life and philosophy. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit weird. But Ed, G geniuses are very important. Without geniuses, we're going to suffer. They produce innovations. However, our society is selecting against intelligent people, people who are extremely brilliant, like Isaac Newton. You, you covered this topic in your book, The Genius Famine, and Bruce Charlton also agreed with your 
assertion. So for example, Noah Carl and Nathan Kofner's brilliant men, we, we actually need their analyses are being treated like scums by the mainstream. What will be the implication of, of undermining geniuses like Kofner's Carl and the people? Well, I don't know if I don't know if Nathan Coughless and Noah Carl will be regarded as 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 genius. Well, you get you get my point. They're highly intelligent okay, and very. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They are highly intelligent people. Um, I, well, I, I, I think there's two dimensions that we have to think about as to what how we are undermining genius. So, firstly, um, there is a weak negative association between intelligence and having children. So, the result of that is that if geniuses are defined as those that have outlier high IQ or what and, and make major major innovations. Then as our IQ declines, which it is declining by about 1.6 points per decade, then we will have fewer per capita major innovations. Um, but the genius is not just a person that has high intelligence. The genius is also a specific psychological type. As I look at uh, myself and Bruce Charles and look at in the genius famine, they tend to combine outlier high IQ with all that that implies with moderately low agreeableness and moderately low agreeableness means altruism and empathy and moderately low conscientiousness which is impulse control and rule following now the normal run of the run of the mill academic the sort of incrementalist that doesn't make any major breakthroughs or anything like that the normal run of the mill academic um that person will combine normal range high intelligence so let's say an iq of 130 something like that with um high conscientiousness which is associated with doing well in the education system and doing well in employment and high agreeableness which is again associated with doing well in the education system and doing well in the world of employment um the person that is the genius is a bit different the genius combines outlier high intelligence um, so very, very high intelligence with, um, with, with those traits are feminine traits that I just mentioned. Uh, women are higher in conscientiousness and agreeableness than men. But the genius is outlier high intelligence with moderately low conscientiousness and moderately low agreeableness. And that means having low conscientiousness, he's, he doesn't bother with the rules and he's not rule bound in his mind. And he'll think outside the box and he'll be, be better, more intuitive and better able to make original connections, which is what coming up with a new idea is about. And uh, being low in agreeableness, he, uh, new ideas always offend against vested interests. Uh, but uh, they always rock the boat and can really upset people. But being low in altruism, he either he won't care that he upsets people. Indeed, he might quite enjoy upsetting people. Um, or being low in empathy, he'll be a bit autistic. So he won't be able to anticipate that he'll upset people, even if he did care. And so it's this um, intelligence uh, personality profile that, that is the essence of genius. And so um, under conditions of harsh group selection, which we had until uh, the Industrial Revolution, you, you, we, you were selecting in favour of geniuses because the groups that were tolerant of geniuses um, uh, producing an, a small optimum number of these group selected genius people who often wouldn't have children themselves, they wouldn't breed, they were a social weirdos like Sir Isaac Newton, but they came up with brilliant ideas that were ultimately could be used to benefit the group of which they were a part. And that seems to be the evolutionary function of geniuses. And the group that was optimally tolerant of them was the group that would dominate others in warfare under group selection pressures and dominate them. And that was that. Now, with the collapse um, of group selection, we have the collapse of a system that is based around your group competing and wanting your group to win. And a, 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 a system based around group oriented values of what is the good of the group. And there is a degree to which people understood, perhaps, that these geniuses and tolerating them is for the good of the group to a change in values that's happened, particularly since the 60s, that everything is about what is good for the individual female values in many ways, harm avoidance and equality and everyone getting on together in contrast to these more male values of you know wanting to know the truth and who bugger it, who cares if it offends people, what's important is it's the truth and it, we need to know the truth because we're in, a, we're in a, a group war here and we need to know the truth so that we can, we can produce better weapons or whatever it happens to be. And so that means that the culture changes to a movement towards things that geniuses are bad at. Geniuses are bad at, uh, um, you know, these things like equality. They'll question them and think, well, what's that all about? You know, the geniuses are kind of high testosterone males plus very high intelligence. That's kind of what a genius is. It's kind of like the psychology of a criminal 
plus very high intelligence. And what's increasingly happening is the universities become dominated by, by these dogmas that everything is about equality and harm avoidance and not offending people, is that excludes geniuses because geniuses are, are, are rubbish at that kind of thing. Geniuses can't deal with that. And so if you're in a job interview situation, who are you going to employ? The girl, the head girl type, who's you know, high in intelligence and high in conscientiousness and high in agreeableness and hardworking and comes across as a great colleague in the interview, or just some high IQ weirdo, who are you going to realistically employ? Well, obviously, you're going to employ the head girl. And so that's what's been happening. And so, uh, and that's been particularly promoted by sexual equality measures and promoted by a, a general desire that what's much more important than the truth, much more important than making sense of the world is equality and harm avoidance until the whole culture of the university has now changed such that it fetishizes these individualistic values of equality and harm avoidance. And this, this both, uh, this, this drives geniuses out in the sense that they'll be unlikely to get the job against the pretty head girl type. And also because the genius being a bit autistic and whatever, and obsessed with truth, will be less able to cope with these speech codes and all this stuff. And so he'll be more likely to get sacked like Noah Carl or get, you know, for example, uh, uh, Nathan Coffers had recently had a lecture tour in Korea cancelled. Um, you know, are otherwise excluded from academia. And so increasingly the, the, the academia is changing to a, a kind of a new, to being dominated by a new religion. But whereas that religion was once the religion, or a group oriented religion, and it was tolerant of genius a little bit, but there was an extent to which the geniuses had to be careful what they said about religion, you know, and Isaac Newton was in that situation. He had to be careful to doubt the group oriented values. Um, they've now been driven out. Um, there was a period where the group oriented religion was falling and the individualistic oriented religion was rising. And that was a period of freedom at universities where these geniuses were kind of broadly tolerated. And that seems to have now closed. We have a new religion of individualism that's taken over universities. And so these geniuses are removed from the system. And so therefore they are less likely to find their safe space, which is what university was, and less likely to reach their full potential. So that's why I think the current system is damaging to genius. Well, Edward, you are so sharp because I was going to ask you a very controversial versial question. Is the feminization of university harming the production of geniuses? And you have already yes, answered yes. the question. And this, I, was, this was noted. This was noted. Oxford University in, at, at the turn of the 19th, 19th, 20th century allowed in women students. And it, they then reversed their policy. And they said that no more than one in seven of students that come in should be women. And the reason they did was because they said that it prevents us from having rational and logical debates. Because when we try to have these debates with these women, they take it personally. And they, if we criticize them and they don't like academic disputations and they get upset and whatever. And so the pursuit of truth is, is amoral. The pursuit of truth doesn't involve taking into account people's feelings. The pursuit of truth is a ruthless, systematic quest for truth that doesn't involve empathy at all. And that's perfectly fine for men because the, the extreme male brain, as Simon Baron Cohen summarized, it is very high in empathy, very high in systematizing and very low in empathy. And so that's fine. Once you bring females into the environment, you have two problems. First of all, uh, women tend to be lower in systematizing and higher in empathy. So in a sense, they are just on average, you know, uh, of course, there are exceptions, but on average, they're going to be less logical than men, all else controlled for. They're going to be higher in empathy, higher in agreeableness. They're going to be more rule following. They're going to be more, uh, they're going to be less, in, they have, they, their intelligence is more bunched. So fewer of them have outlier high intelligence. They're going to be more rule following, more agreeable. So what they're going to be more focused on is everyone getting on, everyone being happy, everyone being content, everyone being equal, everyone not being offended, everyone feeling validated. They're going to, that, that will be more important than the cut and thrust quest for the truth. And so it's going to change the culture of the universities. And uh, what's his name? Talal. I always forget his name. This uh, researcher from Lebanon. And he's, he's demonstrated that uh, well, only a tiny minority of a few percent can start to change the culture of an organization if they are vociferous and, 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 and push for their own, their own interests. And the second thing is it's an evolutionary mismatch anyway, because men and women in evolutionary terms aren't supposed to work together. And so um, they, what you get if you men and women work together is the men seeing the women not as colleagues, uh, but as a potential sexual opportunity. Exactly. I was going to make that point. And, and treating them as such and promoting them as such. 
So you'll get cases of you know a pretty girl who, who are up against a genius, um, male genius. Well, who's going to get the job if it's if it's men doing the appointing? Um, or, or the opposite could happen. You could get a, an ugly, frumpy, but highly intelligent woman up against a uh, up against a you know, really good-looking guy. And it's women doing the appointing, and who are they going to appoint? And so and so it it it, it messes up the entire the entire system. It creates an evolutionary mismatch. Um, and so on every level, I think it's, it's been damaging to the universities to have um, the introduction of, um, of, uh, of, of women. And it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a shame because there are, of course, some women who are extremely intelligent and make important contributions to academia. But we have to, and I'm sure those women that, that are like that would appreciate this, we have to look at it from the outside, uh, purely from the outside, purely objectively, and think, what is it that... that, that that aids genius. And what, it, what is it that aids genius as a society is that we have this optimum balance between group oriented values and individual oriented values, such that we have a belief in freedom of, uh, of intellectual uh, uh, discovery. Um, and it aids th uh, these geniuses if there is a safe space. It doesn't have to be university. It could be in Victorian times. Of course, you'd have the scholar rector or the, the gentleman scientist like Charles Darwin or even the Aberdeenshire shoemaker, uh, Thomas Edward, who, who collected mollusks and was given a grant by the Crown to research mollusks. But the university has functioned for a period of, I don't know, 100 years maybe, while, while Christianity was in decline and, and uh, multiculturalism was rising as being not too individualist, not too group oriented. So you roughly had free speech and you, and you could research what you wanted. Go back earlier and you had big problems at universities with people questioning the religious system. Um, so it's not like this hasn't happened before. But 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 uh, it's it's uh, yeah it's 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 it, it doesn't it doesn't aid the production of of genius and so it's an environmental reason the genetic reasons are of course huge why genius is declining because we're getting less intelligent um, but but uh, it's an Ed, Edward Edward we'll discuss these issues later in the interview I, mm. I, I plan to ask you about the Flynn effect but I have an interesting point to make. Homosexual men also enjoy the company of heterosexual women. Therefore, if a boss is gay, he will also be likely to prefer a pretty woman relative to a, to a man. The, the male disposability thesis, people naturally prefer women. And if a woman is pretty, she has an extra advantage. Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's true. So to the extent that... Uh, um you might get homosexual. There is some evidence that homosexuals are more intelligent than heterosexuals. Um, and I know that there, there are some people that dispute this, and I'm, I'm not able to answer their, their dispute. All I can say is that the data I've seen from the GSS is that on average, homosexuals are more intelligent than heterosexuals. So you would expect homosexual. Uh, I don't know quite why that would be. Uh, one possibility is that uh, if you are more intelligent, you, that's associated with openness and that's associated with low instinct, as I said earlier. And so therefore, maybe people that were more intelligent would allow themselves to act on their homosexual instincts. And also, it would, it, perhaps it is that we have a society that increasingly kind of promotes homosexuality. And if you are intelligent, more intelligent, then you're lower in instinct. And so you're more environmentally sensitive. And so you require the exact evolutionarily adaptive roadmap in a way that less intelligent people don't. And if you don't get it, then you're more likely to become gay or something. I don't know what the reason is. But they, we would expect them to be overrepresented in higher education, gay men. They probably are overrepresented in higher education. And so you're quite right. Perhaps they would appoint women for that reason as well. Yeah. And Edward, I also wanted to talk about homosexuality and intelligence. Based on studies that I've read, the link between male homosexuality and intelligence is very, very strong. The link between female homosexuality and intelligence appears to be a little in, inconclusive. And my argument is that male homosexual experience extreme discrimination. So for example, according to one study published by NYU, in all countries that were surveyed, people preferred lesbians in relation to gay men. So because gay men experience such high levels of discrimination and homosexuality re represents deviation from the norm, I assume that gay men are more intelligent because their activity represents a greater digression from the norm. I could be correct, I'm yet to test it scientifically. Um, you, you might be you might be right about that. I mean, to the extent, yes, to the extent if my my model is correct that basically intelligence is a component of k strategy a component of being evolved to a harsh environment that's what intelligence is um 
And so that and if you are a cage strategist, then you are you tend to be highly environmentally sensitive. I mean, our strategy animals, you know, they're born able to walk and they get on with it. The more cage strategy you are, the more care you need from your parents, the more uh, of a childhood you have, and the, the more therefore you are uh, reliant on being uh, placed on the exact evolutionarily adaptive roadmap by the group of which you are a part. You are more environmentally sensitive. And so it would seem to me to follow that um, intelligence as a component of, of, of case strategy would be associated with being more environmentally sensitive, with being lower in instinct, and thus perhaps being open to non-instinctive preferences, and thus perhaps among men being more likely to be gay. Um, the, um, where, whereas among females, the uh, sexuality is extremely fluid. Uh, and it's only about 0.2 genetic. Uh, and, and, and it seems that um, you, you know, it, it's, it's not abnormal in prehistory for women, uh, in particular in polygamous marriages, to uh, lesbian, to co, to allo parent each other's children when the, um, the, the, the male with his many wives is not investing enough in them and, and, to, les and to bond as a lesbian pair accordingly. So it's more normal. Whereas it's less normal to have um, men who are like long term gay in prehistory. You have men, I don't know, they have a very high sex drive and there's no women around and they have gay relationships briefly as teenagers, but you, you don't, it doesn't seem to go beyond that. So you could be right about that. It would be interesting to test. Yes, we, we, we should do a study. Now we're going to talk a little about the relationship between intelligence, artistic traits, and religion in light of your paper, The Myth of the Stupid Religious Believer. Mm. Why, why are artistic traits correlated with lower levels of religion and higher levels of intelligence? Well, they're, they're correlated with higher levels of intelligence because of what I, I already have, have addressed this. It's because as, as you are more intelli intelligent, is about solving cognitive problems. You can solve a cognitive problem better if you can take in more information. And if you can take in uh, more information, you will be more, you, 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 you will be more easily overwhelmed. You will, be, you, you will be literally confronted with more information. You'll be more sensitive and you'll be more likely to have therefore uh, aspects of autism, such as being extremely sensitive to sound or whatever if you if you if you are able to not shut out information to not just shut things out and to which non autistics can um, and take everything in then you will be better at solving problems and therefore you will have a higher iq score so that's why i would think that that uh, being autistic would be associated with outlier high intelligence the second reason is that autistic people are obsessed with systematizing and so if you are obsessed with systematizing again you will have a reason to, to score better in iq tests because you will be absolutely obsessed with systematizing you will get joy out of systematizing so that's why i think autism is associated with um intelligence um autism is associated with uh, negatively associated with religiousness because um uh, what what religiousness involves doing uh, is to a certain degree being empathetic. So if you are high in uh, uh, being religious is, is correlated with empathy and empathy is the opposite of being autistic. We conceive of a scale with the, the extreme male brain at one end, which is high in systematizing and low in empathy and the extreme female brain at the other end, which is very high in empathy, but which is system blind. And um, if you are high in empathy, then you are very, very interested in um, uh, you are in the external signals of internal states. That's what empathy is about finding the external signals of internal states. And, and, and it, you, it's not much of a step from that to what you might call hyper empathy, which is that you over detect, you over detect um, uh, signals of internal states. Um, and indeed, you transpose that interest in looking for external signals of internal states into the world itself. So it seems like the world has a mind the world is showing you evidence of, of, of internal states. So you are detecting agency in the world. You have a hyper agency detection mechanism as it's, as it's being called. So the that's what really, Sorry? I said the HUD. The, I, I, the I percentage agency detecting device. Okay, I was going to say bless you. I thought you were sneezing, <laughs> but, but um, yeah. So so yeah, but that exactly. So so th so so therefore, um, people who are heart that is why people that are schizophrenic. What schizophrenia is is basically hyper empathy. It's where you are so uh, attuned to looking for the external signals of internal states that you 
over detect them and you get it wrong. You interpret a smile as a sign someone that is in love with you or a frown as a sign someone wants to kill you and you become paranoid. And people who are schizophrenic very, very strongly tend to believe in God. Um, so um, be because they are over detecting agency and this goes into how they see the world itself. They see agency, they see they empathize with the world itself. And so that is why autistics are the opposite of that. They completely lack that ability. They see the world in purely mechanical and logical terms. And so that's why they, they don't feel the presence of God. All right. Ed, why are women more religious than men? Well, I think there's two reasons. One, one is that uh, women have been evolved because they are, uh, that we have a division of labor in evolutionary terms whereby the man does the hunting and the killing and the fighting and the women look after the children and the, the nurturers. They're going to be better at being nurturers if they are high in empathy. And as we just discussed, if, if, if they are high in empathy, they are more likely to be religious. And so that would be the first reason why uh, and this is true even among men. So men that score higher in empathy are more religious than men, even if you control for sex, um, who score lower in it. So that, that, that's the first reason that women are higher in empathy. The second reason is probably a specific kind of selection. So um, men are more are strategists. They can just, you know, their strategy can be to have sex with as many people as they possibly can. They lose nothing from the sexual encounter. Just have as much sex as they can with as many fit, you know, beautiful young women as they can, genetically fit women as they can, and hope some offspring survive. The women can't operate like that. The woman, because she can get pregnant, she has something to lose from the sexual encounter. So this makes her picky. So therefore she sexually selects to a greater extent than the man will for socioeconomic status or the ability to future in the future attain socioeconomic status um, so, and in particular she wants evidence of investment she's more likely to survive and her offspring are more likely to survive if the man invests in the female and invests in the offspring so therefore the man does that now that being the case the man wants evidence that um, it is his offspring and therefore he wants he, he wants to control the sexuality of the female and therefore you have the development of patriarchy whereby um, the female's sexuality is controlled. Now, it's highly adaptive for the group to have patriarchy, because if you have patriarchy, then you don't have these men engaging in intergroup conflict, engaging in intra-group conflict all the time, fighting each other jealously over females, because they know that their women are controlled, then it has to be jealous, they can work together. And we know that at the group level, the group that is higher in positive ethnocentrism, that is internal cooperation, is more likely to beat the other group, all else being equal. So therefore, having patriarchy promotes positive ethnocentrism. So therefore, the group that is patriarchal will be selected for. Now, we know that the religion of the religiousness, we know that's being selected for. It's associated, it's found in all cultures, it's associated with genetic health, it's associated with uh, mental health, it's associated with physical health, it's associated with fertility, uh, there's parts of the brain, specific parts of the brain that are associated with it and so on. That's under selection as well and therefore it makes sense that if that is good for the group to be religious, for the, if that's under, uh, because it promotes positive and negative ethnocentrism as the will of God as well, and so if that's under selection then the patriarchy will be under selection and the religiousness starts to promote the patriarchy as the will of God. So patriarchy becomes interlinked with anything basically that's adaptive becomes interlinked with the religion. Uh, the more, because the more likely um, you are more likely to follow it if you believe that God is telling you to. And so that everything adaptive becomes interlinked with the religion. One of those things is patriarchy. So therefore, when a man is selecting who he wants to marry, if a woman is is religious, she will be patriarchal. And if she is patriarchal, then he can trust that it will be his genes that will be passed on. So he will therefore sexually select for religious women. And therefore, non-religious women will be selected out. And therefore, uh, women will gradually, in a sort of arms race, become more religious than men. And so that's another reason. So I think you've got two reasons behind it. One is, is that they're higher in empathy. And the other is that, that they are higher in being selected for traditional religiousness and patriarchy. Now, once that traditional religiousness breaks down, as it now has, 
then of course women are just higher in empathy and easier to brainwash and so they can be inculcated with the new you know religion of multiculturalism which is sort of anti-patriarchal and bad for the genetic interests but under under normal conditions of pat under normal conditions they, they will be pushed towards being patriarchal because the women that don't display their patriarchal and don't kind of force themselves to believe that they're patriarchal um uh, those women will be selected out I agree with you, Ed. Cross-cultural research shows that non-patriarchal societies are rarely successful. Patriarchy motivates men to produce. We need to strike a balance between equitable patriarchy and inequitable patriarchy. patriarchy. Presently, we're living in the age of equitable patriarchy. Women are autonomous, they have rights, but laws are still designed to benefit women. That, that's my own view. No, another question. So do men score higher on tests of, of general knowledge because of higher levels of intelligence? With what you said about inequitable patriarchy, I think that's true. We, you, you have a, we, we have a system where patriarchy has broken down, but, but we still have laws that lag behind and that assume that women um, are looked after and uh, 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 this sort of there are benefits if you're a woman to patriarchy because yes. society will look after you um, uh, um, and will treat you with a certain degree of deference uh, and and those laws and uh, indeed those cultural ideas you know the idea of being polite to women or they're still in place and they are because deep down these women are adapted to patriarchy and and so they like it and there was some interesting research on that that women seem to like men that are um, sort of Sexist, exactly. But, sexist, but, but men. gentlemanly. Yes, yeah. women like aggressive and dominant men. But this is a new question: Do men score higher on tests of general knowledge because they are more intelligent? Um, I I doubt it. I because the the, the difference in uh, intelligence between men and women is between two and four points, so it's not that high. I suspect that, that it's more likely that men are basically higher in autistic traits and so they just like learning lots and lots of things and knowing how the world works i would suspect that would be why they would be score score higher in, in general knowledge yeah many psychologists are wondering why men are more likely to write letters to the editor why men publish more books i, I think this is a fascinating oh well that would be that, that that's a i mean that that can be seen as a different matter i mean that can be that men are more competitive Yes, and they, so they have publish more. You know, they like status. Yeah, and they're status driven. They're status driven, exactly. They're higher in testosterone. There was an interesting paper I, I did. Well, Richard Lynn did a, a target article in the, uh, the Mankind Court a few years ago on why it is that you still get these differences in status between men and women. And I argued that, well, part of it is, of course, that men have uh, a, a more people that have outlier high intelligence. Part of it is that men are slightly more intelligent. But a big part of it is just that is the, the difference in personality between men and women, that even if a woman and a man have equal intelligence, the man has more drive. He has more of a desire to seek status. He has more of a desire to fight. He has more of a desire to get to the top. And so I think that, that and obviously publishing books or anything like that is a, is a way of status seeking and of reaching the top in a particular hierarchy. And that is what men are supposed to do. Women also compete uh, in hierarchies, but their hierarchies, female hierarchies are of, are of a very different kind. And getting to the top is not necessarily about achieving things, but it's about getting on with everybody so that everybody trusts you and everybody likes you and you, you control people in a much more sort of soft power, uh, subtle kind of way. Yes, female competition is subtle in contrast to male competition that's more aggressive. So far, we have been talking about religion, intelligence, gender, etc. No, Edward, I'm sure some of our listeners are saying Thomas Aquinas was a genius, but he was very religious. Explain to us the situation of people like Thomas Aquinas and even Newton and Stanley Yaki, a brilliant theologian, philosopher and scientist. Why are some religious people so brilliant? Um, well, I don't see why we would think that they wouldn't be brilliant. I don't. I don't really see that it follows. I mean, the the the. Uh, what what do you mean? I'm not sure I follow the question. So 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 for example, many st studies often show a relationship between atheism and intelligence. And oh, some... I see. I see what you mean. I yeah, okay, I exactly. I okay. Well, so so um, so the it should be understood that the correlation between intelligence and religiousness is uh, the negative correlation is weak. 
So it's only about minus 0.2. So although that means on average, um, a person who is an atheist is going to be more intelligent than a person who is a, a theist, there's going to be plenty of exceptions to that rule. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, we've only been collecting data on the correlation between intelligence and religiousness since the 1920s. And since that time, among people that were intellectual, among people that were the, the cream of the society, the cleverest people, it's become increasingly fashionable to doubt religion and be skeptical of religion and, 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 that, and that sort of thing. And as I said earlier, what you would expect is that intelligent people would observe what the um, the dominant value system was either in the society as a whole or in the group of which they were a part. And they would adopt that value system and, 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 and they would force themselves to adopt that value system. And so it may have, it is, it has been the case in America and in Brit Europe since the 1920s that there is a very weak relationship between um, intelligence uh, and uh, a negative relationship between intelligence and religiosity. Interestingly, that relationship is becoming weaker. What, and indeed, in, in some studies, no longer exists. Now, why is that the case? Well, because uh, 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 an overtly, I mean, really, they have religious ideas. They kind of uh, uh, reify concepts like equality and things like this. You know, actually, it's very close to religion. But if you define it as belief in God, then increasingly you have this ideology, multiculturalism, postmodernism, whatever, where people don't believe in God. And this ideology has moved down the social hierarchy um, such that now people that don't have particularly high intelligence believe it. And so there is no longer this clear relationship between atheism and intelligence in a way that there was 50 or 60 years ago. And so um, it, it may be that that relationship is contingent on what the dominant set of values are in the society. So in Africa, the evidence is that the, in um, sub, sub Saharan Africa, uh, belief in God is positively associated with intelligence. Um, and because it is the people that are uh, the, the sort of tribal people, really, who have, will tend to have lower intelligence, who will say, oh, I don't believe in this God. No, but I, I believe in these spirits or I believe in the ancestors. And equally, in uh, Korea, I did a study recently, and I found that belief in God is positively associated with intelligence, because the people that are uh, less intelligent, well, they, they haven't adopted Christianity or whatever. That's quite a new thing in Korea. And so they hold to earlier worldviews, though, the Korean version of Shinto, which is called Sindo or whatever, and there's no belief in God. So if it's a society uh, where... Um, a people where the dominant value system, even among the upper class, is to believe in God, then you would expect the upper class people to believe in God and yet be very, very intelligent and brilliant. And that's perhaps what you're seeing with someone like Thomas Aquinas or Isaac Newton. Yes, I, I, I like your take, but there's another follow up. Medical students are extremely smart, but they're also very, very religious. Why? I know medical students who are extremely religious. The, the well, I actually, I actually looked at this in, I've looked at this in two books that I've done. Uh, my first book, Meeting Jesus at University, Rights of Pastors, Student Evangelicals. And I did an anthropological fieldwork study of fundamentalist Christian groups. Uh, and I found that, uh, that there's, there was loads of medical students in, that, in these groups. And then secondly, my book, Religion, Intelligence and Evolutionary Analysis. Uh, they are, yeah, they, medical students are very religious. Uh, why is this the case? Well, we have to look at, as again, I stress, the fact the correlation between intelligence and religiousness is weak. It's point, it's minus point two. If you look at that's among population samples, uh, and that's like 30 or 40 years ago, it's getting weaker. The correlation among students is even weaker. It's minus point one. Um, and I think the reason for this is that there are three, there are two key factors that, or three key factors that predict it getting into university, doing well in the world of higher education. One is intelligence, and that is weakly, negatively, at about minus 0.2 um, associated with religiousness. The second is conscientious, conscientiousness. So that's rule following um, and uh, uh, impulse control. And this is strongly positively associated with getting into university, like 0.55. Um, and it's also weakly associated 
positively with religiousness. So people that are more, um, uh, more religious tend to have higher impulse control. And this is probably because we were selected under harsh Darwinian conditions to be religious, but we were also selected to be higher impulse control so we didn't get thrown out by the band and we were selected to, you know, um, there's a God on our shoulder saying, you know, we steady on, don't break the rules, don't punch him in the face or whatever. And the third thing that predicts doing well in higher education, and by the way, is particularly high, these two factors, conscientiousness and agreeableness. There was a study in, I think, Belgium, which, or the Netherlands, which looked at the different personality traits of students in different subjects. And it found that the, uh, firstly, that it found that the medical students were very religious. And secondly, it found the medical students were particularly high in these traits, agreeableness and conscientiousness. So they're very altruistic and very empathetic. And these traits, again, predict being religious and believing in God, and they also predict doing well in higher education, and they also specifically predict wanting to study medicine, perhaps because there's an element of nurture and kindness and whatever to medicine. So that's why I think there is this strong exception with medical students. I, I agree with you to, just to an extent, but now I would like to explore the Flynn effect. You have argued that the Flynn effect is actually reversing. Please explain this for our listeners. So what the Flynn effect is, is the, as I mentioned earlier, you, you can conceive of intelligence as a kind of pyramid. At the bottom are intelligence specialized abilities, which are weakly associated with intelligence, such as the ability to drive a car, the ability to spot certain kinds of pattern, the ability to do crosswords, whatever. Uh, as you move up, you have the three main kinds of intelligence, which, which, which those many, many broader uh, specialized abilities can be factor analyzed down to linguistic intelligence, mathematical intelligence, and spatial intelligence. And at the base, you have G, general intelligence. And this is highly genetic. It's about 0.8 genetic. Um, and the things that are at the base of the pyramid, these specialized abilities, they are very weakly genetic. They are overwhelmingly to do with environment and, 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 and that kind of thing. And they're only weakly associated with intelligence. Now, the IQ test measures general intelligence and it measures intelligence, but it also measures other things. So it, it measures these specialized abilities, which are weakly associated with intelligence. As an instrument, it's not a perfect measurer of intelligence. So this means that if the nature of the environment changes, then the IQ test um, uh, cannot be compared across time. You have to hold the environment constant. If you hold the environment constant, then you can compare people on, these, on this IQ test. If the nature of the environment changes, um, then the IQ test can have problems. So you can't compare IQ tests across time. But that's what the Flynn effect involves doing. So what seems to have happened across time, and it's been noted since at least the 1930s, is a secular rise in IQ scores, consistent with a rise of about 2.3 points uh, per, per decade every decade. Now, if that was really to do with a rise in intelligence, then we'd be geniuses compared to the people 100 years ago, which, of course, we're not. So what's going on? Well, what Flynn found was that the rise was happening on these um, subcomponents of the IQ test that measured certain specialized abilities, in particular, um, uh, uh, the ability to think in a highly analytic way, what's called the sort of pattern spotting. And this was increasing. And this is highly environmentally influenced. It's massively to do with environment. And this was increasing. And it was increasing so massively and so quickly that it was overwhelming everything else that was happening on the IQ test, all the other things that it was testing. And it was coming out as an overall IQ score rise. Now, that doesn't mean that intelligence is going up because what was happening was that something that is weakly associated with intelligence, which the IQ test, which is an imperfect instrument at measuring intelligence, was also measuring, um, that thing was going up and overwhelming everything else. That was the Flynn effect. And what he argued is that what modern society does is it teaches us to think in a more analytic, more scientific way. It makes us more educated, basically. And it teaches us to think in a more analytic, more scientific way. Hence, schooling has changed from learning lots of things off by heart, like when my grandparents were at school, to thinking what were the causes of World War II? What were the causes of whatever? You know, to think in an analytic way. So it has pushed us to our phenotypic maximum on um, this particular specialized ability, and that has resulted in a secular rise in IQ scores uh, of 2.8 points, or whatever it is per decade, across the la across, over, over this period of time. Eventually, in the late 90s in certain Western countries, this re reached its peak and then went into reverse. 
So we had a negative Flynn effect. You found that the, the Flynn effect is, is reverse, i.e. IQ scores are falling. And this was found to be on the more gene, on the G, on the genetic component of, in, of intelligence, on the, on the subsections that were to do with genetic intelligence. So what seems to have happened is what my colleague Michael Woodley of Mani calls the co-occurrence model, which is at the genetic level, we were getting um, less intelligent. But this, well, our IQs were going down, basically. But this was being cloaked on the IQ test by a massive rise in these specialized abilities, which overwhelmed everything else that was happening on the IQ test, um, such that it came across as an IQ score rise. Once this, I, once this um, weakly, this, this heavily environmentally influenced, weakly genetically influenced, weak measure of intelligence reached its phenotypic maximum, then the underlying IQ fall started to poke through even on the IQ tests. And if this had been going on for a long time, and if it was on G, if it was for genetic reasons, then we would expect this fall to be not on the environmental uh, components of the test, but on G. And that is what was found. That is what's going on now. So the Flynn effect is an illusion. It is, it is a product of the fact that the IQ tests are an imperfect measure of intelligence and they are not measurement invariant. They cannot be compared across time. You can compare other things across time because they are not as sensitive to the environment. They're not as influenced by the nature of the society, such as reaction times. And these have been, been measured since the 1880s and they've been consistently going down consistent with a fall in IQ of about 15 points between 1880 and the year 2000. And there are many other measures I've looked at in my book, At Our Wits End, Why We Become Less Intelligent and What It Means for the Future, and also in the Genius Famine, on many, many other measures uh, that are invariant across time, our intelligence is, is falling. So that seems to be what's going on. An enthralling response. No, Ed. I've read serious studies making a relationship between intelligence and physical appearance. Would you like to tell us a little about this development? Well, it's only a very weak relationship, but um, yes, it does seem to exist. So um, if physical appearance, if we're talking about someone looking good, then normally we are attracted to people that have low mutational load. Um, if, if they have low mutational load, then that means they will be able to maintain a symmetrical phenotype in the face of disease, um, and therefore uh, we will find them attractive. If they are a male, they will be able to produce an optimum level of testosterone in the face of disease because they won't have high mutational load, and so we find them attractive. If they're a female, optimum level of estrogen, whatever. And so, you, and so if you have low mutation, a high mutational load, you will be physically ugly. If you have high mutational load of the body, you will sure as damn it have high mutational load of the mind because the mind is 84% of the genome. Um, and so this means that uh, if you have high mutational load of the mind, your mind will work less well, it will be slower, and you will be less intelligent. And as a result, there will be a weak a correlation between being between having mutational load, in the sense of being physically ugly, having an unattractive face, um, and having low IQ. And there is indeed evidence that, that exists. There is a cor weak correlation between mutation between there is a weak correlation uh, between being good looking and being intelligent. Um, a second reason for it would be sexual selection. So people will tend uh, in in prehistory in, in history you know to sexually select particularly uh, 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 for looks for people that are good looking, and they will tend to also sexually select for people that are of status of high status. High status will be predicted by high intelligence. So the two will become player typically related. Um, and, and so therefore being good looking will be associated with intelligence and socioeconomic status has been found across time between the medieval era and the modern day to be about 0.7 heritable. And so you, you would expect um, there to be a relationship between being good looking and socioeconomic status and thus intelligence, a weak relationship, and this does appear to exist. So I, I think that's, um, that's, that's what's... Uh, that's what's behind it. And also, I mean, going back to mutational load of the brain, um, you, would, you would expect um, if the brain develops suboptimally along suboptimal pathways, then those, then those pathways will be reflected in all elements of the body if you develop suboptimally, including in the face. And this is why there is a weak association, for example, between, um, uh, between having a narrow face 
and having high IQ, very weak association. Why is that? Well, if you look at people that have very low IQ, people that have Down syndrome, for example, they tend to have a wide face. So, so you can see um, that, that if something goes wrong, the face seems to, with the brain, uh, the face seems to get wider. So you would expect that in a very small way to be the case within the normal intelligence range. And there is research from China indicating that is so. Yes, but, but, but what's interesting Ed, is that some studies suggest that people t t prefer to do business, business with broad faced men. What, this is just an aside, it's not extremely pertinent to what we're saying. I'm just pointing out this fact. But we also do know that on average, attractive people earn more and we also conflate beauty with competence and other positive attributes. Now, I would like to talk about the relationship between IQ and innovation. Asians on average are smarter as measured by IQ tests, but they win fewer Nobel prizes, why? Um, can I just go back to what you were saying about beauty and competence? That, that would imply that there was a halo effect, but it's been shown that these relationships operate at the genetic level. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. But with the, with the, the Asians, the, the, the reason, again, is if we go back to what we're talking about, about empathy and systematizing uh, and genius earlier. So what the genius is, is, is outlier high intelligence plus moderately psychopathic traits. Um, Asians, by which you mean East Asians. Yes. Um, are, uh, are more case selected. So they're very, very strongly adapted to a much harsher environment than white people. That means they have a, basically a smaller gene pool. That means they can produce fewer outliers. They're more bunched genetically, they're more similar. So there's less diversity. So that means they will produce by chart, you'll get fewer people that have outlier high IQ or outlier low IQ. So that's the first, they're more like women in that sense. So there's fewer outliers. And secondly, they're more like women in the sense that because it's such a harsh ecology, it's so important for them to, to nurture uh, and, and, and for them to get on and for them to cooperate with each other. And it would be intolerable in a society that's only just surviving to have these nasty psychopaths and, and dreamers wandering around. So they get selected out. So you so you so the people become very, very, very high in agreeableness and conscientiousness compared to Europeans. And they're bunched towards the middle. So there's less outliers. And so you're much less likely to get the the ra by, by random genetic chance, a person who is outlier high IQ plus moderately psychopathic personality. So that would be the first reason. And the second reason would be that even if that person manifested, he would manifest into a very, very conformist society, which would, which would make it much more difficult for him to reach to, to be a genius because his originality and eccentricity would be even more strongly discouraged than it would be in the West. But I don't think, I think that the main reason is genetic. I did a paper on this with my Japanese colleague, Ken Yakura, and my Dutch colleague, Jan Tenijenhuis, um, and we showed that there are certain candidate genes that are associated with basically curiosity, which is a big part of genius, being intellectually curious. These are the highest among Europeans, the lowest among East Asians, and intermediate among Finns. And interestingly, it's been suggested that Finns, are, compa compared to other people, Europeans have highest intelligence in Europe and they have the lowest level of genius because they are adapted to this more harsh uh, ecology where, where cooperation is important and the gene pool is small. So I think that's why East Asians, are, even though they are five points higher IQ, um, tend to have far lower per capita Nobel Prizes. And not just Nobel Prizes, but field medals and, and all other uh, you know, measures of intellectual achievement. Yeah, I, I read your paper on Northeast Asians, and, and I would like to add my piece on individualism. As we both know, West, Westerners are more individualistic than people from Asia, and individualism is linked to taking risks, conf, confidence, and deviating from the norm. So it should logically follow that because Asians are less individualistic, they're also less likely to, to produce breathtaking innovations. Yes, it would be a balance between individualism and group orientation. If you were too individualistic, you wouldn't be able to produce a society in which there would be any, any uh, great geniuses. It would just be chaos. Um, but, but, but if you are too group oriented, then again, there's not enough individualism. So it's the precise balance. We can call it a genius strategy between being group oriented and being individualistic um, that, 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 um, that gets it right.
No, if no. you're too low in being selected to be group oriented, no, no. then you end up with artificial group orientations, ways of causing group orientation, such as cousin marriage or tribalism or whatever. And, and I, I, I guess that European countries sit in a kind of Goldilocks zone where they're a, a bit selected to be group oriented, but not too much. No, no, Ed, the last time when we had a discussion, you interviewed me and we talked a little about Barbados. And my thesis for Barbados is yet to be tested, but it's quite simple. Bayesian slavery was, was extremely brutal. However, planters developed a system of rewards and punishment. So slaves who failed to comply, who, who failed to comply were often punished. Slaves who were compliant were rewarded and treated well. So maybe selection in Barbados in, in, encourages rule following, higher levels of self-control and long-term intelligence. What's your take? This would be my collateral relative, um, Sir Richard Dutton, wouldn't it? Who was the governor yes. of Barbados. Yes. I, I, perhaps he should get some credit for this idea. Um, that would that would um, that would certainly make sense. I think yes, that would that would that would make sense. That you that the slaves would have been under selection pressure. Uh, if you look at the slaves in the Islamic world, well, they had no hope. They had no hope of having children. They would be castrated or they'd be kept as galley slaves or whatever. So they're they're out. That they're they're, they're going to have trouble passing on their genes. Um, slaves in Americas and uh, under British rule, of course, could pass on their genes. Um, they could also, if they worked hard, uh, buy their own freedom. And so you, you've got a system which is going to um, permit, under harsh Darwinian conditions that they were still under at that time, um, the, the, the slaves that are the most conscientious and the, mo the, mo the most um, uh, ag agreeable and the most intelligent to, to be disproportionately able to attain their freedom or su otherwise survive um, and pass on their genes. So I think it can be regarded as a selection event. And if that was what was going on in Barbados, to a greater extent than in other countries, you might expect there to be some sort of difference between the nature of the Barbados population and, the, as you say, the population of the Congo, where, where the, if, if there weren't things like that going on. And what's also intriguing about, about Barbados is that in Barbados, slaves, especially professional slaves who worked in technical professions and free people of color were, were often seen as more productive than, than the Irish. Well, that would that would make sense, I guess, because the Irish the Irish would have come there as indentured slave, indentured servants, and so they would have been probably very low IQ people, uh, absolutely desperate for some kind of work, who would have made their way there. Whereas the freed slaves would we would expect to, to have been the intellectual and um, social, like personality wise, like the cream of the population, like the most intelligent um, slaves uh, and, and the slaves that were the highest in sort of general factor of personality, which is a sort of uh, a, a factor that predicts doing well in life. So they would have been an elite population. And so you would expect them um, to do much better. In much the same way now that you see that in, in, in America, uh, you, uh, immigrants who have come from Africa uh, who tend to be quite elite Africans from uh, the Gold Coast and places like this, do very, very well in America, better than whites, because they are like the elite of that country or the super elite. And so you would expect them to perhaps uh, to be to be better uh, than, than uh, to be more agreeable people to work with and to be more assiduous than the white uh, indentured servants. Yes, and Ed. Irish Americans migrated to, 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 to the country as poor people. They worked in low paying jobs. Over today, the average income of Irish of Irish America is higher is higher than the national average. Irish Americans have assimilated into American culture, like East Germans, etc. Black Americans have been living in America for a long period, however, the IQ gap is still persistent and the subculture of black ghettos seem to be quite prominent in explaining the wider black culture. So this is my question. Why is it so hard for African Americans to assimilate into American society? Um, well, I, I think that 
first of all, um, African American as, as a category is quite as, is quite large, increasingly so. It used to be that African Americans themselves would distinguish between those who they saw as mulattoes, and those who they saw as black. Uh, the level of white admixture is about 10% 10, uh, 10 among uh, blacks in the south and the southern states and about 20% among blacks in the northern states. And there are people that identify as black where the level of black admixture is even higher. I mean, you get people that are 50% black, like Barack Obama, who seem to identify as black. So it's a very, very broad category. But I think that they have been less able to assimilate because they are simply genetically more uh, more more different. I think that's the, 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 the key thing. They have lower intelligence by about 15 points. That's the first thing. But even when you control for intelligence, um, you, uh, black people in America still have high levels of illegitimacy, high levels of crime, high levels of whatever. And the reason for that is because they're also a uh, fast life history strategists. And so they are higher in sort of psychopathic personality traits and uh, and things like and things like this, um, whereas the difference between the Irish immigrants uh, and the immigrants from other places, all being European, would have been much smaller. And of course, the Asian immigrants will do very well because they'll be more intelligent and they'll be higher in conscientiousness and higher in agreeableness. I mean, basically, in, uh, uh, doing well in life is intelligence plus pro-social personality. Those those are the key. Th well, plus you know plus opportunity. Um, and those, those are the key things. And the, the black population of America is less intelligent and it has a more antisocial personality. So um, it is, however, more a little bit more ethnocentric than whites. So you might expect them to, in that sense, to band together and assist each other's interests, which is perhaps what BLM is partly doing. Yes. But, um, so there is that in their favor. Uh, uh, and it should be emphasized that, of course, you get black people that um, that are very very a small minority. I mean, there's, I mean, sixteen percent of blacks in America have an IQ of above a hundred, um, and a very, but a very small percentage are, are highly intelligent. And of course, those people. Um, and the terrible thing is that if those people do well, um, then they're they're told by other blacks that they're you know they're traitors. Exactly, my they're, they're point. They're coconuts. They're they're they're, they're you know, and, and 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 it's not betraying. It's for, for me as a white person to do as socioeconomically well as an East Asian is not betraying white people, is it? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's just silly, absurd, absurd, yes. absurd uh, bitter uh, resentment philosophy. And even by other, by white people, it's okay to be racist towards a black person and call him an uncle Tom and even call him the N word. If that black person is right wing and conservative and doesn't, isn't a socialist, then you can treat them how you like. They're, they're not black anymore. They're white adjacent. The whole thing is is, is a totally hypocritical and, and Machiavellian and, and, and self-serving. And, um, and I, one thing I do suspect is going to happen, as I, as I we discussed when you were on my show, I think that we're going to come apart as a people. I, I, I think that you're going to get areas of chaos and you're going to get refugia of civilization. And I think that the more intelligent um, black people and South Asian people are, of course, going to throw their lot in with the refugia of civilization and then we'll mix together. And the, the, the low IQ whites will mix together with the third world chaos. That's what's going to happen. I think. Yeah, it's black. Um, black Americans suffer from self-imposed barriers. Some persons have actually studied this topic extensively. So, for example, educated blacks who are successful are less likely to apply for loans. They assume that America is racist and they will be rejected even though this is not the case racism is declining and racist sentiments are also declining but they tend to wallow in, in, in negativity i don't know why well they're, they're lower in um they're lower in they're, they're higher in certain kinds of neuroticism than white people they're higher in most white people are higher in social anxiety uh, and, and therefore they have lower self-esteem and they're more likely to kill themselves. Um, but black people are high, black people are higher, it, they, they, they are lower in trust. So they're, they're more cynical. Um, and so therefore they are less likely to use banks than white people. Uh, they're less likely to have the COVID jab and, and whatever. They're, they're, they're less trusting of authority. They're lower in trust so, um, and more likely to think they're going to get conned. And that's partly, I think, a product of low intelligence, but also it's, it's partly a, a product of um, certain kinds of neuroticism and it's partly a product of low agreeableness. Um, so I think that's perhaps what's going on there. Yes, and because they are lower on tests of trust, they're less likely to invest in the stock market. It is seen as a scam and there is actually evidence to support this assertion. Black, white Americans are more likely to, to invest in stocks and other risky assets. 
Yes, well, and, and also they, they, they are they have lower time preference. Yes, uh, real ratio. So but but what, what's interesting interesting is that the studies exploring racial differences in time preferences have been done by economists. And the economists are unlikely to take a scientific opinion. But if you're, well, I'm sure you're familiar with, this, with some of these studies, but for people who are interested in studying time preferences, they should read economists, particularly the National Bureau of Economic Research, not, not really scientists. Scientists these days are shying away from such topics. Okay. Yes, but the, 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 the economic data, and studies are quite interesting. They are also more impatient. Again, yes, yes. Again, a study. Well, that, would, that would make sense if they were fast life history strategists. It makes sense that, that you would be more impatient. But then, and, and it's a, a sort of symbiotic relationship because if you've been brought up in poverty, then that will calibrate you towards a fast life history strategy, whatever your genetics is. So that will make you more impatient as well. Um, but but uh, yeah, that's, that's what we would expect. And no. so therefore they, they can't wait for the payoff. They would rather take a, a smaller payoff now than a larger payoff far in the future. So far, the, sh the show has been enlightening. I've learned a lot from you as usual, Ed. But I have a question that's divorced from intelligence. Why should we care that testosterone levels are declining? Um, well, ultimately, if uh, testosterone levels continue to decline, then nobody will be able to have, no man will be able to have children via normal means. So that's very bad. Um, secondly, we've already discussed that genius seems to be high intelligence plus testosterone. So if, if testosterone levels are declining, then genius is going to be declining. And thirdly, we, uh, what are the corollaries of this? What's causing it? I suspect partly what's causing it is going to be poor health, perhaps poor genetic health. So that's an underlying thing we should be concerned about. Um, also perhaps what's causing it is the ev extreme evolutionary mismatch for so many men, that there's this new kind of evolutionary um, crucible of wokeness, which tells you that maleness is toxic and tells you that it's okay to be a person of a different, you know, it's bad to be a man and you should think about changing sex and whatever, and what this is doing to young minds. So I think that the, the, the fall in testosterone, which seems to be very, very dramatic, um, is a reflection of all kinds of bad things. And so we, we should be concerned about it. Well, well, Ed, I am sure that our audience is definitely loving the, 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 the conversation so far. It's, it's Yes, it, it, it's quite fascinating. But Ed, at some point, you will interview me again, and the audience will love our topic. We plan to talk about the dating preferences of Black men. We do, and you're, you're going to yeah. have a camera by then, aren't you? You promised me. I, I would like to have one. I would like to have one by then. But Ed, it was a pleasure to speak to you. And I expect to invite you again at some other point. And Ed, did you did I submit to you an interview, one I did with Greg Johnson? Uh, yeah, I think you did, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, please share that. Greg is a smart guy. Before you go, what was that book called again? I, I, I wrote the title down, but I, I've lost where I wrote it down about like the black upper class in oh, America. Oh, Lawrence Otis Graham, our kind of people. And you may also consult Birmingham, Stephen Birmingham. He researched black elites. And there's someone called William Greenwood. William Greenwood is, is an older writer, but those are the better books. And Fr right. F Franklin Fraser. He did did some work on the black bourgeois. Frank and Fred. Yeah, right. yeah. It, was, it, was, it was called Our Kind of People, Greg. All right. Yeah. Great. Pleasure to talk to you, Lipton. Yes. And right. I'll invite you again. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.